Thanks, Steve. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Vision Calvary Chapel. I think like all of us, I have been... The Lord tells us that we should lift up all of our leaders and to pray for them. And when a nation has godly leaders or righteous leaders, the nation rejoices. But when there are wicked in power, the nation groans. But President Trump said this, and I quote, It was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening. End of quote. I mean, if you watch the videos, he was standing right here speaking, and he literally turned his head at this moment as it grazed his ear. I mean, you watch that video over and over again, and you think that was the closest that you can get to a near-death experience. And it was something that I think shook everyone to the core. And so I want to take a moment for us to pray over our nation. I like to pray over President Trump, and I like to also pray for the individual that was badly wounded there, who was shot, and for the man who died. Uh, this man who was a former uh, fire chief, his name's Corey Comparatore, and uh, he died shielding his family from those stray bullets. If there was ever a man that acted as such, a brave man to protect his own family, he was the epitome of that, and I'd like us to pray over uh, his family as well. Uh, so would you please join with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we have all been shook to the core as we have seeing the things that have transpired in our nation. Lord, we have been grieved by the wickedness in our land. But Lord, you have called us in the times of despair to seek you, to pray, to humble ourselves, to ask that you would forgive us of our sins so that we might be healed, that we might be healed not only personally, but as a nation. We pray, God, for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, we pray for a quick recovery for that individual who is badly injured by one of those stray bullets, Lord. I don't have their name, but you know, and I ask God that you would please heal. If there are surgeries that are needed, please guide the surgeon's hand. And Lord, we pray for that person to make a speedy recovery. Lord, we lift up Corey Comparatore, Lord. We ask, God, that you would please his family that is grieving. We lift up his family, Lord. We ask that you would please, as the God of all comfort, comfort them during this terrible time. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And Lord, he made that ultimate sacrifice Lord, from what I've been reading of him, it seemed like he was a regular churchgoer, a man that served his community and laid down his life for his family. And so, Lord, be with the comparatory family. Lord, we pray, Lord, for your help and your blessing and your comfort during this time. Lord, we lift up President Trump to you, Lord, and we pray, God, that you would continue to protect him and, Lord, that you would heal him and Lord, may your will be done in our country. Lord, we need your help. We need your help. And we have problems that man cannot fix. And so Lord, we ask God that you would be merciful, that you would be gracious, 
And Lord, that you would use our leaders, Lord, in a way that would glorify you as impossible as that may seem, Lord, from time to time. We ask, God, for your help. May evil not triumph. May the wicked not prosper. Lord, we ask that as the church, we would stand up for righteousness. Seated by your grace to be upon our country, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, and we all say, Amen. Please continue to pray over your nation, pray over your state, pray over your county, your city, and pray over your family, because these things are very, very important. And what we're seeing in the world today is just a glimpse of the way that it's going to be in the next five to ten years, if the Lord should so tarry, things are going to get prog progressively more violent and more wicked. But the darker the night, the brighter the light. And that's what we need to remember. You are the light of the world. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your Father in heaven. Church, are you with me on that? And the Lord is doing a very special move in our church. We've had an overwhelming response to our house groups for this summer, so much so that we've had to add two additional locations. Uh, what a blessing to see such a beautiful response, an exciting response from the church. We're saying we want to grow in our relationship with the Lord this summer as we study God's Word uh, together. And so just to give you an update on what's happening with the locations and to give you a little bit more uh, detail as to what's going to be happening. We have three locations in Irvine now. One uh, by John Wayne Airport, so the 405 and Jamboree. Uh, one by the Irvine Spectrum, and this is for those of you that might have uh, children, so it's for families with kids. Uh, we've added another one in Irvine by the Great Park. Um, we have one in Orange, which is going to be the catch-all for Orange, Tustin, Santa Ana, that area. Uh, we have one in La Mirada, so off the 57. Uh, we have one in Foothill Ranch off of Alton and the 241 Toll Road, or the 5 in Alton if you want to take it all the way up. And then also one in Huntington Beach. And so there's going to be seven locations for you guys to choose from. And if you've not yet signed up, uh, you still can. I, I mean, we kind of had an overwhelming response the day before it was supposed to start, so much so that we're like, house groups are getting out of hand. Like, this is so amazing. And so it caused us to push back one week so that we could accommodate as many people as possible. But that was a one-time shot. Like, we can't push it back another week. So house groups will start this Wednesday, uh, July 17th at 7 p.m. At one of these locations, you can join. Go to visioncalvarychapel.com and you can register for the location that is nearest to you. And we're going to be studying through Matthew chapter 6. Uh, part of Jesus' teaching uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, and it's going to be an amazing time in God's Word. And so, you can go on your phone, download the app, whatever you prefer to do, and come and study the Bible with us this summer, seven-week series, and then we'll get back here together as one large church family for our house group's potluck, which is always a special uh, time to conclude our series. So, this morning, without any further ado, it's great to be back with you. I know you guys are blessed with Pastor Josh's really Really encouraging and exhortive word to be those watchmen uh, that are aware of their surroundings, aware of what's happening in the world, and to not be afraid to stand up for what is righteous and for what is truth. And so today, and this was kind of one of those things where I felt like the Lord had been preparing uh, my heart for what was going to be transpiring this weekend, which I wasn't aware of because I don't know the future, obviously, but God does. And so this morning, you're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 with a message entitled, Stand Fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So you go through your Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then head into Acts, Romans, and then 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's page 733 in your Bible if you're wondering. Uh, just kidding, it's not. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13, excuse me, 16, verse 13 says this under our first section this morning Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, and be strong. 
In the Greek language, this word for watch is very, very in depth. It's very, very definitive of something that we would typically use as a one word, one word definition. The Greek language is so rich where it means to give strict attention to, to be cautious, to be active, to take heed lest through remission and indolence some destructive calamity suddenly overtake you. Jesus used this word watch in three unique ways, but I'll share a few of those with you here. In Matthew 24, verse 42, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. He used this word again in Mark chapter 14, verse 38, where he told his disciples to watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, in Luke 12, 37, he says, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. To watch means to be ready. And I think of this in light of recent events, that this is a good word for the church today. For we don't know when it's our time to go. We don't know when temptation will come our way, and we do not know exactly when Jesus will return. And so I must ask you, are you ready for the return of the Lord? Will the Lord, when He comes, will He find you in a place of having faith? Will He find you ready for His return? Jesus asked in Luke 18, verse 8, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? See, for us as the church today, we need to be ready for the return of Jesus. And secondly, we need to be watching to make sure that we're making decisions not based in fear. There is not one good thing, have you noticed, that will come from making a decision from a place of being fearful. Often, you'll hear people say, hey, beware of your surroundings. Beware of your surroundings. And yeah, that's a great practice to have in your life. But what Jesus was saying to his disciples was for them to be aware of their spiritual surroundings. I mean, if you're honest with yourself, and especially as a Christian, knowing God's word, do you think that what is happening around the world or in our country or in our state or in our county is just happenstance? Is it just, well, it's just the way things go and that stuff happens? Well, absolutely not. That is not the case. For in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 through 13 from the New Living Translation, Paul writes, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's the reality. And he would even go on to say in verse 13, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil, and then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. And so let me read it, verse 12 again. Ephesians 6. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, 
but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, all too often, we rely on our physical senses to discern spiritual things. And when we do, you lose the battle. See, the battle belongs to the Lord. Be aware of your spiritual surroundings and pray. Secondly, from 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, it says, stand fast. Now, why do you think somebody would tell someone to stand fast? I mean, if you told somebody, hey, stand fast, what would you mean by saying that? See, when you're telling somebody to stand fast, you're telling them to stand stand their ground in an unyielding position. Do not give the enemy one single inch of ground. Hang in there. Don't give in. You know, there's a really fun word to say in the Greek language for this phrase, stand fast, and it's stako. And I think, man, plant your stako and don't move. But it literally can be defined as standing firm or to persevere, to persist, or to keep one standing. Some translators would even describe this phrase in context to mean your commitment and allegiance to the freedom that you have in Christ. Contextually, Paul would be dealing with legalism that had crept into the church of Galatia, particularly Judaism, but there always seems to be one if not two things that are harmful to the church. Harmful to you. Number one would be the enemies of the truth. And number two would be the works of the flesh. See, the devil is an enemy of the truth that is found in God's word. Jesus told the religious leaders of his day who were trying to destroy him in John 8, 44 through 45, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Listen to this. Jesus, God, all-knowing, says, there is no truth in Satan. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. These things are very important to understand. But Jesus says in verse 45 of John 8, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe in me. For there are those in our world today that simply reject the truth. And so there are enemies of the truth. They not only reject it, but they want to keep it suppressed so that others can't hear it. That sounds like what's happening in our own country today. I reject the truth, and I don't want anybody else to receive it either. And so the devil doesn't stand in the truth. There's no truth in him. And we also know from Jesus that he is the father of all lies. I mean, have you noticed in your own, you know, life situations how there are people that would rather believe the lie than hear the truth? They would rather be told what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. Paul asked the Galatians that they would not view him as an enemy just because he spoke the truth. And that's why if you're a Christian today and they label you as an enemy, you'll understand why. Because you speak the truth. And there are enemies to the truth. But if you whittle it all the way down, who is actually the truth? Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And because Jesus is God, it means he's immutable, which is one of the characteristics of God, which means he never changes. And if Jesus is immutable, it means that the truth is immutable regardless of the culture. However, 
When culture starts to infiltrate the church and starts having more influence on the churchgoers than the Bible, the destruction of that church has begun. And there will always be granted outside influences, but we should always go back to our foundation by asking ourselves this simple question. What does the Bible have to say about that? What does the Bible have to say about that so that I might know what I should do? This is called having a biblical world view. So if you've ever wondered what that means, it just means that I view life through the lens of Scripture. But if I'm not, living my life under the impression of the flesh or my sinful nature is a terrible place to be. But the works of the flesh will always be exposed as such. It may not always be immediate. Often it can take a while. But anything other than faith in God's promises and the work of the Holy Spirit is an act of the flesh, and it will come to nothing. If it's not a work of the Holy Spirit, it's an act of the flesh. And so church today, if God has set you free from sin, good works cannot do that for you. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior and you're thinking, well, my good deeds will get me to heaven. Good works do not forgive you of your sin. Trying to be a good person doesn't give you the victory over sin or forgiveness of sin. So church, you need to stand fast. You need to not allow the influences of the world to creep in and to taint and to lead you astray. Because God set you free from the power of sin. You're free from it. You don't have to earn your way, and you don't have to be controlled by the lusts of the flesh. All of those things have been taken care of by Jesus on the cross. So stand fast. But did you see the second part of that exhortation? Stand fast in what? In faith. See, we'll eventually get to a point where our faith is forged in the deepest place of our own despair. It's during these times that the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, will dig deep inside of us to draw out even the smallest amount of faith that we may have. I mean, often, if we're honest with ourselves, our faith is buried under our intellect or our resources, our ingenuity, our pride, our situation in life, our good health, our tangible securities, or our social structure, you know, just to name a few. But faith in Jesus is often layers and layers beneath All of those aforementioned practical things. And those things have a tendency to get stripped away. And the more that we have, often the more stripping away takes place. Where it's like, oh, that got removed, so I fall back on my next thing. And then that gets removed, and I fall back on my next thing. And then that gets removed, and I fall back on my next resource. And then that gets removed, and I fall back on my next thing, whatever it might be. But then you get to a point where the only thing you have to fall back on is Jesus. Where now your faith kicks in. The insulation has been removed. When everything gets stripped away, what are you left with? Because I wonder if you've ever had the experience where you've gotten to that point of being desperate for the Lord and now you're praying and now all of a sudden your spiritual antennas are on and now you feel like God isn't answering your prayers. You cry out to God and all you hear is crickets. Lord, are you even there? And then what you feel in your heart is going through your mind as you think to yourself, like, why? Why, Lord, would you allow this to happen? And when, you call, when I call out to you, it doesn't seem like you hear a single thing that I'm praying. And it may even bring you to tears because you feel that God doesn't care about you because if he did, why would he allow this to happen? Furthermore, it's very discouraging when you prayed and nothing immediately changed. It's a very difficult place to be. It's a very difficult place to be for in that very moment, now the Lord begins to scratch the surface of your faith. You've tried conventional wisdom and applied all types of different strategies to try to find a solution, and the layers of your resources are being peeled away like an onion. Why do you think at 
Certain times that God is thought to be silent when we pray. I mean, is he remaining silent or are we just not hearing the reply that we want to hear? I mean, there is such a thing as called selective hearing. That's just not something for kids in your house. Like a yell, hey, come down. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. I tell Ruth like, hey, do you want to do something? Hey, I want to go too. You know, like how does that work? But I wonder if when we pray that we have selective hearing as well. And like, Lord, no, that can't be from you because that's not the answer that I'm looking for. Lord, I'm waiting for the answer that I want to receive from you. And listen, sometimes the Lord will say yes. Sometimes he'll say no. Sometimes he'll say not right now. But whatever the will of the Lord may be, our conduct should be worthy of the gospel. It should be worthy of the gospel inside of church and outside. You know, I really like the translation of Philippians 1.27 from the New Living Translation. It says this. I'll read it to you. It says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, Paul writes, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Our stand should be as one. The spiritual battle that we are involved with, we should be fighting it as one. And living a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus will play itself out in personal holiness and even the collective purpose of the church, which I think we're being reminded of today. Remember, Jesus prayed for the church in John 17, 21, that they would be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That the church would be one. Not backbiting, not divisive, not filled with gossip, not kicking people when they're down. See, what Satan would like to take place in the church is the exact opposite of what Paul writes the church should be doing. That they would be standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. See, the enemy's strategy, if we were to put pen to paper, would read such as this. I will know that you are failing and falling as you are divided in your heart, divided in your purpose as the church, and divided in your relationships with one another. I mean, why do you think we live in a state, the state of California, that is one of the most liberal antichrist states in all of our country? Why do you think it is that we have some of the most well-known pastors and many of the largest countries happen to, or uh, churches in the country happen to be in our state? And yet, even with all of that, we live in a place that is so against God. They are pretty much pro-anything that is against the Lord. And the answer to that question, I think, is found in the fact that we have failed to walk worthy of the gospel as Je uh, of Jesus. That the church as a whole is not pulling their own weight as we have succumbed to the pressures of society that would seek to silence the truth. So that the truth wouldn't be communicated with words and also that the truth wouldn't be communicated with actions. Both things are very important. And we're instructed to stand together in one spirit and one purpose. And what is that one spirit? It's the Holy Spirit. What is the one purpose? To walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Striving together, not striving with one another. There's no room for selfish ambition. There's no room for tearing down one another. There's no room for the enemy in the church when the people of the church have linked arms as one, even as Jesus and his Father are one. That's you and me here today. There's no chinks in the armor when the church is of one mind that the name of Jesus be glorified. There are no spiritual weaknesses in the church when there is no watering down of the call to be holy as he is holy. And thirdly, we see from 1 Corinthians 16, 30, uh, 13 to be brave and to be strong. 
brave and strong. You know, it's interesting. This, if you read this passage in the Old, Test, in the Old, King, uh, Old King James Version, this Greek word for being brave is actually translated to make a man of or make brave or to show oneself a man. If you read it in the Old King James, it'll say, show yourself a man. And I think this is because there was a time in our history where bravery was sought out as a characteristic of manhood. That's why in the Old King James Version, again, it reads, show yourself a man. And there's something very special when godly men are brave enough to show themselves as such. You've heard that quote a million times, but it is true. The only thing needed for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And this is a call for godly men and women to be brave and to be strong. There are times in our life where we will go through difficulties and it will be unpleasant to say the least. But you need to be brave and you need to be strong. Acknowledge and submit to God. May that be your first priority. Lord, your will be done. Lord, this is very difficult. I need your help, Lord. I need your strength. I feel like just cowering back into the shadows. I feel like keeping my mouth shut. I feel like not doing what you've called me to do. You need to watch. You need to stand fast in the faith. And you need to be brave and strong. Be on guard. Watch yourself. Stand your ground upon the word of God and don't let the pressures of society gain any territory. Don't let hidden sins gain ground in your life. The things that nobody sees and nobody notices, those internal private things will eventually impact you when you go to do what God has called you to do. You don't want to be corroding from the inside when God has a great call upon your life. To be brave. This is the only time in the entire New Testament where this word is translated, be brave. Or this phrase is translated, be brave. I believe because it takes bravery to stand for righteousness. We need to cast out the works of the flesh from the church and stand fast in the freedom that we have in Christ. Jesus said, and we know it, he's the way and he's the truth and he's the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. So you need to stand fast in your faith in Christ. Don't be enslaved to sin. Don't be entangled again by the lies of the devil seeking to get you to be burdened with the responsibility of earning your way to heaven or being good enough to receive God's favor. Don't allow yourself to be enslaved by the works of the flesh. You know, often we won't realize until it's too late that In religion, which is man's attempt to reach God, the works of the flesh thrive. If you've never heard the comparison between a relationship and religion, this is the simple breakdown. Your relationship with God makes your salvation possible. Your faith in Jesus is what grants you salvation. There's no standing on your tippy toes or piling up your good works and trying to earn salvation. Jesus paid the price, and through faith in him, you receive something that you could not obtain for yourself. Religion would be man's attempt to earn their way to heaven. I do this, and I do that, and I go there, and I you know, say these things, and I hope if I, at the end of my life, I've done enough good things to try to get to heaven. And all of those things are works of the flesh, because it has nothing to do with faith in Jesus. Remember our study in James. That there is a connection between faith and living that life of faith. But doing good things is not able to be reverse engineered to cover sin. So don't allow the flesh to control your walk with the Lord. Don't remove the place of God's grace at work in your life. Because you can choose to bring honor to the Lord or dishonor to Him by your actions. So if we've been freed from sin, why would I go back into the bondage of sin? I need to stand fast in my faith. I don't want to go backwards. And so this command, I need you guys to watch, be ready, be prayerful, 
Be aware of your spiritual surroundings. I need you to stand fast in your faith. Don't give any place to the devil. And I need you to be brave and to be strong. Listen, it takes courage to follow Jesus. And you need to be strong. And you need to be brave. And you need to have faith. And you might feel pressured. You might feel isolated. Don't give in. You might feel excluded from the group or alone. Don't give up. And do not, certainly do not change what the Bible says and what the gospel is all about. And let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel when you're around your Christian friends and when you're around your non-Christian friends. We're in a place right now where the Lord is raising up a generation of men and women who are on fire for the Lord. This is happening. It is happening around our country and around the world. It's happening here in our church. As you are starting to discover that there's something more. Lord, I feel like there's something more that you have for me. Lord, I feel like I'm, I'm to seek you and to draw near to you because you're stirring me up. Lord, I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be one foot in and one foot out. I don't want to just tick the box that I went to church on Sunday. Lord, I want to have that lifestyle that's on fire for you where I hear your voice and I'm used by you. Can you sense it? Because the Holy Spirit is moving in this place even right this very moment. I like to share from David Guzik's commentary where he quotes a commentator by the name of Clark, which says, and I quote, Be strong. If one company or division be opposed by too great a force of the enemy, strengthen that division and maintain your position. Summon up all your courage, sustain each other, and fear not. End of quote. That is the role of the church. We are to walk worthy of the gospel. We understand that it is faith in Jesus that saves. And it's going to be the power of Jesus in our life that gives us the victory. But when the church links arms... When this body of Christ is looking out not only for themselves, but for the interests of others, all for the glory of God, you'll start to see that there is major spiritual growth that takes place. There's going to be numerical growth, sure, but it's going to be a depth that you weren't going to be able to travel until you made that decision to go deeper in your relationship with the Lord. And now all of a sudden, we're of one mind, one spirit. Glorify the Lord. Whatever I do, whatever I say, I'm doing it for the glory of God. And there is a power that shakes the gates of hell in that church. That's where we're at today. That is what the Lord is doing in your marriage, in your family, in you. And I know that you can sense that from the Holy Spirit. Because the Word of God is living and it's powerful and it speaks to the innermost recesses of, our, recesses of our hearts. And so when we read, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong, we should do so knowing that the Lord our God is with us wherever we shall go. And when stuff just starts popping off and things start to get bad, we're not the ones losing our marbles. We're not the ones panicking in fear. Because the Lord will sustain us. The Lord will give you peace that surpasses all understanding and He'll use what He has done in your life privately, personally, in a public way. Where you have covered yourself in prayer, you have sought the Lord for wisdom, you have asked Him for strength. And then, it, then it's game time. Some of us, we've been sitting kind of on the sideline, riding the pine a little bit, and the Lord's like, no longer, you're getting the call up. It's time to go. It's time to start doing what you say you believe. Because there is a great sifting that's taking place. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. There never was, even though there was some semblance of it in the past. There's never been a middle area. But you're starting to see right now who's in and who's out. 
Who believes in what God's word says and who wants to change it and kind of buffet style the things that it says and I'll pick that and I'll reject that and I'll take this and I don't think God knew what he was talking about here. That's not where you want to be. Having a biblical worldview is going to guide you through your darkest moments. The Lord said, fear not, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You will call for me and I will answer. You will hear my voice and I will show you which way you should go. And so, this weekend, we're going to remember this for a very long time. And I hope that in light of these things that have happened in our country, that we also attach to this now the truth of God's word, that we are to watch, we are to stand fast in the faith, we are to be brave, and we're to be strong. For we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Amen? Let's pray.